Well, let's jump into Medicare. I'm feeling depressed or I'm anxious. Is that okay to claim cosmetic surgery or Medicare? Not okay. The treatment for depression is not cosmetic surgery. There's a lot of confusion around the billing of cosmetic surgery and whether it applies or not. Medicare does not reimburse cosmetic procedures ever. What Medicare reimburses rightly is things that people need as opposed to things that people want. No one is suggesting that patients shouldn't have cosmetic surgery. You should be able to have it if you want it and you also should be able to be safe when you are having it. But taxpayers should not pay for it. This program's content is provided solely for informational purposes and should not be construed as medical, legal or financial advice. Views expressed are opinions only. Our discussions are general and not focused on specific companies or individuals unless explicitly mentioned. We strongly recommend consulting a qualified medical professional before contemplating any major or minor medical procedures. Be advised that some content discussed may be distressing. Discretion is advised. The hosts of this program believe all people should be able to access cosmetic surgery procedures free from judgment. Welcome to Surgery Secrets, Beauty's Dark Side. I'm Madison Johnstone and I'm here with Michael Fraser, your podcast hosts. This podcast is about exploring the dark themes of the cosmetic surgery industry globally, with season one focusing on Australia. Today we are lucky enough to have Dr. Margaret Foe with us. She is a lawyer, nurse and regulation expert. She did her PhD on Medicare compliance and billing Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Fo. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. With this episode, we're hoping to help patients navigate the complex world of Medicare, complaints and regulation. Of course, no one wants their surgery to go wrong. No one expects it or plans for it. Even if a doctor does everything right and follows all the protocols, things can still go wrong. When a patient is botched, has a poor outcome, is unhappy with their results, they can struggle financially with their health and also face other consequences. They also struggle to understand the complaints and regulation process in Australia. Dr. Fo, is it really that complex? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes, it really is that complex. Um, health regulation in Australia needs a complete uh, overhaul. We have um, a mishmash of state and federal regulators, um, all of whom will be relevant to patients who have experienced um, a, an adverse outcome or some form of problem with their cosmetic surgery. But knowing how to navigate that is very, very challenging for anyone. When you add into this that patients who have been botched or they are cosmetic surgery patients, they're often... A unique kind of traumatized as well so they have to understand and navigate this process while processing what's happened to them themselves. That's right I think for cosmetic surgery patients there's this added layer of I guess sort of guilt and shame that you know it's my fault for, for going and doing this um, and therefore do I even have the right to complain and the answer to that is an emph emphatic, yes, you do have a right to complain because you have a right to be safe and you also have a right to have cosmetic surgery if that's what you want to do. Um, so, But it's, I think it's very complex for these patients because it can be embarrassing too, very embarrassing for them to um, talk about what it is that's happened to them, particularly if they've been botched. You know, that's a very... Um, difficult thing for anyone to talk about and you're talking to a regulator. So this is someone who's not emotionally connected with you. So it's like telling a complete stranger something very, very intimate about yourself. So it's, it's hard for people to come forward but it's also very, very important that we do because what it does is creates a layer of transparency in the cosmetic surgery industry. It's only with patients coming forward with their stories that we can learn more about what, what goes wrong and therefore how to fix it. 
Margaret, can you help us understand the process for making a complaint, for example, if I wasn't happy with the outcome of a surgery in New South Wales, like what are the, what's the process for making a complaint? It, it, look, what I would say to anyone in Australia wanting to lodge a complaint, I'd probably start by going to the APRA website because that is the national sort of centre, if you like, um, and from there there's some pathways you can click on. You know, what do you want to complain about? Are you complaining because you're worried about a, a practitioner um their conduct is making Australians unsafe and you want to complain about that? Or are you making a personal complaint about the way you were treated by a practitioner? Does your complaint relate to the way you were spoken to? Was it the way you were treated? Is it the outcome of your surgery? And APRA will also help direct you to the relevant state authority. So it might go to one of the medical boards uh, it might stay at the Healthcare Complaints Commission. I know this is all sounding very confusing and that it, that's actually the problem. It is. So going to APRA is a, the, the simple part, I suppose. Go to the regulator and start there and hopefully you'll get guidance to take the next steps. Well, yes. Um, it's also true, though, that um, certainly I've dealt with patients who have been um, passed between regulators and that is unfortunately quite common. Certainly I have um, many conversations dealing with that. So someone will say, um, I've complained to APRA and they said to me I had to go to OHO because they were in Queensland. So this is the Office of the Health um, Ombudsman. So they've gone to OHO and OHO has said, oh, no, this is a Medicare matter. So they've referred it to Medicare and then Medicare says, no, we're not dealing with this. You need to go to APRA. This is a, a medical board matter. So it's it's very confusing for patients. Um, and really until we get some better alignment of um, that process, patients are just going to have to navigate it as best they can. Do you have a number off the top of your head? How many regulators, councils, boards, just sort of what you were just saying, do you know how many, do you have a number of how many there are in Australia? Yes, I do actually, because I've, I stood in front of a whiteboard one day and drew them all and started drawing arrows, um, it, it, connecting them. And if you just look at um, commissions, boards, um, councils and APRA, there's um, about 30 and then if you add in all the private hospital uh, regulators, um, you know, private hospital uh, acts of parliament and all the pieces of legislation and add all of that together, there's over 60 pieces of legislation and bodies that make up the Australian health system. It's insane. So it's, it, it's just completely, um, uh, it's like a spaghetti junction. That's how I would describe health regulation in Australia. If I'm a patient and I've been botched and I've got two concerns, I want compensation, but I also, let's say I'm in New South Wales, I want compensation, but I also don't want that doctor harming anyone else. I could go to APRA, I could start there in terms of making a complaint about the practitioner and their conduct and separately then there's nothing that would stop me going to a medical negligence lawyer and bringing a claim? You will have to. If, if you um, have been botched, if you want monetary compensation, you will have to seek a medical negligence lawyer and commence um, a medical negligence claim. Now, there are some really good medneg lawyers um, and I would recommend that you find someone who specialises in medical negligence. It's really important. Some of them will do take on these cases, we call it on spec. They'll take it on spec. So that what that means is you won't have to pay any money up front. You'll only have to pay disbursements. So, you know, just like running costs of things they have to do. So modest amounts of money. Um, but most med neg lawyers that I know won't take a case on spec unless they're certain they're going to win. Right, and, and you can understand that because otherwise they work 
for no reward. So, but a good medical negligence lawyer will tell you up front whether you have a case or not. And not a lot of those cases, if you do have a good case, not a lot of those cases will go to court because if it's an obvious win, they will settle. Those cases will settle and you will get um, some payment and you'll pay the lawyer out of that settlement amount. The other option is you can join class action. So there are some um, class actions. There's one at the moment um, against the um, Lanza Clinics and um, that's ongoing. I don't know if they're still accepting new um, claims into the class action. But that's another option if there is a class action and you were maimed by the doctors involved in that class action, you can join the class action. And then what happens is they'll settle an amount for all of the claimants and you'll get your share of that amount. And that can work quite well for some people because there's no upfront costs um, and you're, it's not so combative for you, it's not just you and the other side, you and your lawyer against them and their lawyer. You're actually part of a group claim and I guess, you know, there's strength in numbers and support in numbers. So for some people that's an option as well. Do you think it's important that in, in that case where you've, let's say you go to a lawyer that you ensure that you also go to the regulator and does that create any challenge? Like, Because they'll both take a statement from you so the very first meeting before you go too far at all into a medical negligence claim, you need to have that meeting with the lawyer and say, I've lodged this complaint. Or you might go to the lawyer first and the lawyer might say to you, have you lodged a complaint? Um, and they will advise you what to do to make sure that those two things don't overlap or that they, or whether they can run in parallel without one impacting the other. So the key thing there for people is not to keep anything from your lawyer. You have to tell them everything that you're doing and let them guide you. Would that be also true with letting APRA know that you've gone to a lawyer? I would speak to the lawyer about that. One of the things that we've sort of heard is that people who have had concerns after the surgery, they've had like physical conversations face to face with the doctor or it's been on the phone or a nurse. There's no record of it. And the whole time the, the doctor or the practice will keep saying, you need to wait longer for the results to show three months, six months, whatever it is. And then when it comes to that period that they did wait until they're then told, you didn't follow my dietary exercise um, routine. So it's your fault from this point on and the patient actually has no real record of any of the dispute and the whole time we've heard this from a number of practices, about a number of practices that they make notes, patients said they were happy, patient came in, all okay. So the notes are stacked against the patient, the patient has no record and the patient 12 months down the track is only now making a complaint. So everyone's thinking, why are you complaining now? So um, there's some very good lessons in all of that. So the first thing is absolutely the first thing you should do is speak to your doctor. Before racing off to lawyers or anyone, you should go to your back to your doctor and express your concerns. But from the very first conversation, you keep a journal. You write it down. You must do that. It's really, really important. Um, it's a... And very unpalatable truth in the health system right now in Australia that fake records are prevalent. So the patient's on the phone saying, I'm really unhappy. And what's being written down in, in the records is patient's really happy. Right, so that's just an unfortunate fact. So patients need to take control of the situation. I recommend... Um, have a list of questions. Don't just get on the phone, uh, you know, feeling very emotional and angry, um, even though you're entitled to feel that way. Try and um, have a list of questions. Have a list of the things you want to ask. Put the date and the time because, remember, you've always got your phone records. If you all end up in court one day, you've got, you can get your 
uh, phone records from Telstra or Vodafone, whoever you're with, and you can see the numbers that you have called on what day you called them and how the, the duration of the call. I'm getting very lawyery here. This is all the evidence that you need. So you need to have a journal and you write the date, the time the conversation started, the time the conversation finished, the name of the person who you spoke to. And then write your records because then you've got records that can be compared to their records. And if it's really obvious that you've been keeping those records over time, that will put you in a much stronger position than if they've kept records but you have none. Do you think patients should take a support person in with them to all their consults? I think that's a very good idea because, again, you've got a witness then you've got someone else that is hearing what is going on in the room um and again if things go wrong that will be relevant because that person will be a witness for you and um that will be actually very important evidence for you if the matter were to end up contested later on down the track so we've heard uh, certain doctors won't allow you to have a support person. So they will say, oh, you don't need to worry. You're not going to be alone with me. There'll be a female nurse in here to support you through your consult. But the nurse works for the practice. So it's not someone who's independently supporting you. That's a very obvious conflict of interests to me. Um, you're right. The nurse works for the practice, so is not independent. Um you have to take control and take charge of the situation. And it's it's actually pretty outrageous that any doctor would say that to you, to be frank, um, because you can have someone with you at any medical appointment. We're not just talking about cosmetic surgery here. If you go to any doctor and you want someone with you, that's very common. That would happen thousands of times a day across the country where your partner goes in with you or a friend, whatever. So it's absolutely inappropriate that any doctor denies you the right to have your support person with you in the consultations. So, I, And, in fact, I'd be so concerned about that. That's almost something that you might want to report um, through APRA or, or the health like in New South Wales, you might go to the um, Healthcare Complaints Commission because that might qualify for a complaint about concerns that you might not have the uh, safety of patients. You might be putting the safety of patients at risk. I mean, what are you hiding? What, what is it that you're hiding? Why would you not want your patient to have someone else in the room? You mentioned earlier about patients being thrown from department to department, regulator to regulator. What should a patient do if they feel that this is happening to them? It can be really frustrating. Uh, patients tear their hair out. You know, they get so angry. Um, understandably, I get angry too when I'm dealing with all these regulators and they're passing me from pillar to post. It's absolutely exasperating. There's not a Look, there's not a lot you can do other than express your frustration very strongly. Um, and if you're really still unhappy, you might need to go to your local member, your local politician and say, look, this is what is happening to me. This is not good enough. Um, and actually get above it, if you like, get above the regulators. Have you had any experiences of that successfully helping a patient? I have experience of um, a lot of patients writing letters to their local member about frustrations with the health system. Um, whether it's successful or not, I don't know. Sometimes it can just be um, a release valve. It can be an outlet um, for your frustrations. Uh, look, some people do things like um, post their frustrations on social media. That, that can – I don't know whether that's the right path because that can – I wouldn't recommend it because I think when you're dealing with something as serious as a medical complaint, you need to keep it quite contained because you want to get a good outcome. 
When going to a lawyer, we've actually heard that in Australia, it's very difficult for cosmetic surgery patients to even sue a doctor, given that it might be aesthetic or, you know, it's like not, they're not physically harmed. They're not medically harmed. It's more just an aesthetic outcome. So is that possible to sue for medical negligence if it's just a poor aesthetic outcome? That would be difficult if, if, you had a procedure done and it it doesn't look how you imagined it was going to look but you are okay you, you know you haven't been harmed physically harmed the problem with that will be that it's subjective you would need to you know have real physical harm um, for a medical negligence case to succeed so so negligence um, there's three elements to any negligence claim. There's a duty of care, a breach of duty and damage. Right, so there's clearly a duty of care. The question in that scenario could be was there a breach of the duty of care? But if you've been really badly damaged, there's, there'll be a duty of care, a breach and there will be damage and then it's just quantifying what that damage is. But for something that's just not the perfect outcome, you're probably not going to get even to step two that there's been a breach of a duty of care. So I'm, and I'm obviously not a lawyer, but with the Madden's lawyer case against the uh, Dr. Lancer clinics, it's got just over a thousand people in it now. They seem to have gone down the road of consumer law about the promises that the doctors made and using representations on their social media about their qualifications and, and things like that. And we've since heard another barrister talking about if you are a plastic surgeon and you say online that we get great results every time, that's going to be interesting to me if I get one of your patients. Mm. So consumer law is a very important part of this whole framework. One of the challenges we have um, in Australia is we've got the um, ACCC, which is the um, regulator for the general consumer law. But under the health practitioner national law, we have a very similar offence, which is basically misleading and deceptive conduct. So misleading and deceptive conduct applies across all consumer law, so you can't falsely advertise things. But APRA also regulates a very similar offence over under the Health Practitioner National Law. And the problem is APRA is not very experienced at um, prosecuting misleading and deceptive conduct, whereas the ACCC is very experienced at prosecuting misleading and deceptive conduct. But the ACCC doesn't step in to the cosmetic surgery space very much understandably because again this is one of these problems we've got this overlap of laws two laws that are basically the same two different regulators with jurisdiction over these two laws one is a really experienced regulator uh, for prosecuting this particular offense and the other one is not so again it's it's where these laws intersect that sometimes patients fall through the gaps um, but it is legitimate to be going down that pathway, definitely, because if there has been misleading and deceptive conduct, um, you know, false advertising, promising things that can't possibly be delivered, then that will be relevant to the lawyers. There's quite a few doctors online that actually, both cosmetic doctors and plastic surgeons, that actually say you're going to get a great result or come to us for a perfect result or today's result is going to be amazing. And I would be thinking now that lawyers are looking in the consumer law space, if you feel that you didn't get a perfect result and that doctor is saying you come to us for perfect results, that would be a very clear way to open up to litigation, would it not? Well, look, again, it's not my area of law, mm. but, um, but definitely the lawyers in that area would be targeting that. It, it, it absolutely makes sense. You know, you, you're promising things that you cannot deliver. You don't know, nobody does, that everyone's outcome is going to be great. You don't know that so you can't promise it. 
I think it's really important for patients to understand what they're up against when they, before they even have their first consult for cosmetic surgery, that things can go really wrong and they're not just facing off with a doctor. It's also the very complex system and that there's often a defense for the things that they want to file against. And it's not as simple as saying, fix me or pay me or refund me compensate me. It's not as simple as that. So I think it's really important for prospective patients, especially to understand that it's not an easy thing to navigate this very complex system. Well, let's jump into Medicare. With Medicare, there's a lot of confusion around the billing of cosmetic surgery and whether it applies or not. And we've seen people on Facebook groups, even teaching each other how to say the right things to get access to Medicare a complex system. Do you want to tell us a bit more about it? Sure. Um, this is actually a very easy question to answer. Medicare does not reimburse cosmetic procedures ever, ever. So it's very simple and straightforward. So just ju- we'll jump in, if I can just jump into a bit of law for a minute. So Medicare's law, the enabling legislation is called the Health Insurance Act 1973. That's Medicare's law. In that act, there is a threshold standard and the threshold standard for what Medicare will pay for is that the service has to be clinically relevant those two words, clinically relevant. In Section 3 of the Health Insurance Act, clinically relevant is defined. It has a definition. And the definition is that it has to be necessary for the treatment of the patient. So that's, that's the law. So what we're talking about is... Medicare reimburses only, exclusively, clinically relevant services and that means they have to be necessary for the treatment of the patient. What Medicare reimburses rightly is things that people need as opposed to things that people want. So if you just break it down and simplify it, it's needs Verse wants. So no one is suggesting that patients shouldn't have cosmetic surgery. Not at all. That is not the issue. You should be you should be able to have it if you want it, and you also should be able to be safe when you are having it. But taxpayers should not pay for it. You have to pay for it yourself. So what that means is that none of it is able to be claimed to Medicare. So I'm not just talking about the surgery. I'm talking about the pathology, the blood tests before. I'm talking about the x-rays, mammograms before breast surgery. I'm talking about the surgical assistant. I'm talking about the anaesthetist. All of it. There is nothing to treat. There is no need to treat. There is a want to change something about your body. That's absolutely fine. But it is not able to be claimed to Medicare ever if the reason it is being done is purely cosmetic. Cosmetic surgery is often an umbrella term for a lot of different types of procedures. There, I think some of this confusion comes from that crossover. So we want to do a segment called okay or not okay, even though you very clearly said that none of it's okay, but there might be some instances where it isn't necessarily cosmetic, even though it's being advertised as cosmetic surgery. So we'll we'll do okay or not okay now. Can you claim a female breast reduction on Medicare? Okay or not okay? If it's purely cosmetic, not okay. If there is a therapeutic need for it, then it may be able to be claimed. Can you claim a boob job? So breast implants on Medicare? 
If it is purely cosmetic, no. Can you claim gynecomastia on Medicare, also known as man boobs? If it is purely cosmetic, no, but there is a Medicare item number for mastectomy for gynecomastia and there it includes very clear criteria as to what you have to prove to meet that threshold. So it can't be just that you're overweight, That's it specifically says there, can't be treated for um, obesity. Um, and if the, if the gynecomastia is proportionate to the body, it's, the, that's included in the item description, then it's, it can't be claimed. Um, and then you have to have photographic evidence to demonstrate, and the, the item number actually says you have to have photographic evidence, evidence to demonstrate the clinical need. There's the word again, the clinical need. You need this surgery. It's not that you want it. You need it because it's impacting your life in some way. You Maybe you're getting rashes. Maybe, uh, you know, it, it's impacting you in some other um physiological way and this is the appropriate therapeutic treatment to resolve that problem but if it's purely cosmetic no clinical depression or i'm feeling depressed or i'm anxious is that okay to claim cosmetic surgery or medicare not okay the treatment for depression is not cosmetic surgery can you claim liposuction on medicare if it's purely cosmetic, no, never. But there are item numbers in the Medicare schedule for liposuction. And again, those item numbers have quite clear descriptions of what it is for and what you have to demonstrate before you have liposuction. So in some certain medical circumstances, yes, that can be claimed. What about a tummy tuck? Okay or not okay? Not okay if it's purely cosmetic. However, um, there is item numbers in the Medicare schedule for lipectomy. So that's like a tummy tuck. Um, but again, you have to demonstrate um, this. It's usually after significant weight loss and there might be an apron. But that in itself is not sufficient. You'd have to have perhaps that apron is causing you rashes something like that, under it. You're constantly getting infections. Um, so, But again, you have to prove it. There has to be photographic evidence um, kept in the clinical records. What about a Brazilian butt lift? Not okay, never. A blepharoplasty? Not okay if it's just cosmetic. However, there are blepharoplasty item numbers in the Medicare schedule. So again, it has to be clinically necessary. So... Um, Affecting vision, um, so a floppy eyelid that's drooping over your eye so you can't see, that sort of thing. And I'd say this to patients. If you go in and you're, you're going in to say, I want to have cosmetic surgery, and 100% you know it's cosmetic. There is no other reason for you to have it. There's no, you don't have any clinical problems. You just want it. And at your first appointment, your doctor says to you, tell you what, if we say you've got airway blockages in your nose, I can claim your nose job on Medicare and you don't have airway obstruction. You don't. You never have. If your doctor says that to you, for, for my money, that would be a major red flag. I would be getting out of there as fast as I could and going to find myself a different surgeon because what that tells you is that that surgeon is lacking integrity So, and is willing to be dishonest. And what that means is if something goes wrong, if the outcome isn't great, you go ahead and you and your surgeon end up not getting along and things don't go well and you're going down that complaint path, that surgeon's told you something about their character right there and then. They'll be dishonest again. They have once. 
they'll do it again and it might come back to bite you. What is the benefit to a doctor if it's the patient that gets the Medicare rebate? Why are doctors pushing Medicare? Because it reduces the out-of-pocket costs for the patient. So it, it makes it more affordable. So it's, it's uh, to generate business, right, because it, it brings the cost down if you can claim it to Medicare or on the patient's private health insurance. And private health insurance is a really big problem. It is a very, very big problem because what, what I think patients don't understand, and this is in the international literature on healthcare fraud, what patients don't understand, and it's really hard to explain it to them, is that fraud in healthcare systems impacts affordability of health. So in every time someone commits fraud, bills something to Medicare or the private health insurer, premiums go up for everyone. Right? You, you can't afford to go to the doctor. Your loved ones wait in ambulances that are ramping. You know, it's all part of the same health budget. And if the money's going to the wrong place, there's not enough money where we need it. But private health insurance is a big problem. Premiums going up all the time. And part of the problem is cosmetic surgery being claimed to private health insurers when it shouldn't be. Is that why patients should care about Medicare fraud? Absolutely. Everyone should care about Medicare fraud, not just patients. Doctors should care about Medicare fraud because they're taxpayers too. So when they become a patient or when one of their loved ones becomes a patient then it impacts them as well. So everyone has an interest in stopping Medicare fraud and, and private health insurance fraud too, and they're interconnected. As someone who's been involved in Medicare since it began, have you noticed an increase of cosmetic surgery billing to the Medicare system over, that, over the last five years, for example? In my organisation, we do um, billing, obviously, for like a lot of doctors. We... W- I would not necessarily see that because if you are doing questionable billing, what we know is that those practitioners will want to keep the billing in-house because they don't want anyone to see it. So they're they're unlikely to outsource it to an organisation like mine. However, what I have seen over the last five years or so is a massive increase in um, GPs going into Uh, cosmetic injectables. You can turn anything into a medical consult so easily, particularly things like cosmetic Botox and stuff like that. All you've got to do is take the patient's blood pressure. That's all you've got to do. So the, the reason the patient is there is I want my Botox topped up. And what you do if you're a unscrupulous operator is just say, um, how's your blood pressure been? Why don't we check that while you're here? Suddenly it's medical and you can claim it to Medicare. How might the public check if a fraudulent or incorrect claim has been made against their Medicare? Well, you can jump onto MyGov. That's the, uh, everyone can do that. Register a MyGov account, jump onto MyGov and go in there and have a look at your statement. It's really easy to link your Medicare records and have a look at the statement. Um. Then the Medicare records are not so easy to understand, unfortunately. It's better than nothing. It's a start. What you'll see is an item number and then you'll see a little description, but it's an abbreviated description. These descriptions go for half a page, some of them, and you'll see the first 10 words. So you you often don't get all the information that you need and then you'll get the amount that is paid. So... It, I encourage everyone to check their Medicare records. Every single person who has ever said to me, oh, Margaret, my doctor would never do that, my first response is check your Medicare records. Um, and it's alarming the number of patients that come back and say, I cannot believe what I'm seeing on my Medicare records. They are a work of fiction. Look on your Medicare records and then the problem is what do you do after that? Right, And that's where we've got a real gap 
at the moment. So if you see straight out fraud, and that would be hard for most people to see, to be honest, but if you did, you can report it to Medicare. But what we know about that, unfortunately, is most people that I've spoken to who have reported very serious fraud that with good evidence, nothing's happened. So that can be a bit of a path to nowhere. Um, you can't go to the police, even though fraud's a criminal offence, because the police, the AFP will direct you to Medicare if it relates to Medicare. Um, so the only other thing you can do is contact an investigative journalist. Margaret, I, uh, if you don't mind me asking, we're aware that you've been sort of working almost on like a top secret project to help to understand just how widespread Medicare billing issues are in Australia and it may be a bit premature but if your project isn't ready yet, is there an email that people can email you on that securely to raise a concern about their billing? Yes, look, they can. Um, I have been working on this project um, and it's not too far away from um, launch, but not quite ready yet. Um, but it's a place where patients will be able to go in a way that is very safe to report concerns they have on their Medicare records. Because one of the issues is I don't want this to be about naming and shaming I don't feel that that's productive. It doesn't really help anyone. And the other issue is patients are, are quite vulnerable. They don't necessarily want to disclose who their doctor is. So I think we need to do it in a way that is safe. So I don't want the doctor's name, not interested. What we want, uh, I've, I've got very... Um, very pointed questions about things that will be easy for patients to understand. Um, so that it's like a survey, it's research, it's like a survey and it's going to be anonymous. Um, but not quite ready, but coming. Um, but anyone who does have concerns can email me right now. The, the email address is live. It's called medichecker at protonmail.com. A lot of plastic surgeons are lobbying or they're they're otherwise upset that patients are going overseas and they come back they have complications and they end up in the public health system but they don't seem to be mentioning that that is happening domestically patients are ending up in the public health system as a result of australian doctors botching them or the surgery going wrong in some way yeah of course of course this is um it doesn't discriminate you know you you can have a bad outcome in australia or in the Middle East or America or wherever. Um, so, look, I think that's not um, – I mean, look, we, you'd need to get – if you want to make that argument, you need to make it based on evidence. So what you need to be doing is we need uh, numbers. We actually need the numbers. And, in fact, one of the recommendations I made in the APRA um, submissions was that – was that – Anyone who presents to a public hospital with complications from cosmetic surgery or even someone who presents to a GP clinic, I believe that should be a mandatory notification because the problem is at the moment we don't have the evidence, right? So the doctors can say, this is all happening from overseas and you've quite rightly said, no, it's not. It's happening here as well. But what we don't know is the, the numbers, so what we need to do, if you made it mandatory reporting, then we would know. Mandatory reporting anyone with complications from a cosmetic treatment or procedure and some more information about where they had that cosmetic uh, procedure. Then we could start to put that together. Talking about day hospitals and private hospitals, does it give you access to private health? Like how does that work? If it's in a day hospital or a private hospital, what's the difference Day hospitals are private hospitals by definition. So in public hospitals you might, you'll might you have day stay units where patients can go in and have day procedures and things, not cosmetic things, but public hospitals have those. Any hospital outside of that is a private hospital. Now there's different types of private hospitals. There's a day stay hospital, which is a private hospital. There can be overnight 
which is it's another it's still a private hospital but you can stay a bit longer and then of course there's longer stay hospitals what most day hospitals do will do a mix of cosmetic things and non-cosmetic things so day hospitals you might see they'll do a lot of um eye procedures and they might do so blepharoplasties they might do rhinoplasties and they might also do a mix of cosmetic stuff I know that sounds complex, but if I keep it as simple as I can, there are some day hospitals in Australia, not very many, but there are some that are a hospital, but you cannot use your private health insurance inside that hospital because everything that happens there is cosmetic. There are others that are day hospitals that do have the default benefits and you can use your private health insurance as long as it's not for cosmetic purposes inside those hospitals. Just further on that, would you say to someone who's looking at getting breast implants or abdominoplasty or something like that, if it's being done in a day hospital and they're going to send you home four hours after the surgery, would you think that's a good idea or you go to a hospital, like a private hospital that can keep you overnight? I would never put myself or anyone I cared about in a hospital that wasn't a registered healthcare facility, um, that wasn't reputable, that didn't have um, the ability to keep patients overnight. If you're having something as big as a breast operation, I'd be very concerned if you were in a hospital that didn't have the ability for you to be kept overnight. Our final segment is where we ask all of our guests pretty much the same questions and it's around the theme of this podcast. So we'll jump right into that now. Margaret, from your perspective, what is the dark side of the cosmetic surgery industry? All the lying and falsifying on the records. Unfortunately, patients get told if they've been botched that they got what they deserved, that they should never have got cosmetic surgery because it's an exercise in vanity. What do you say to these people who might make those kinds of comments? That is absolutely incorrect and it's outrageous. Cosmetic surgery is here to stay. It's not going anywhere and everyone has a right to be safe when they choose to go ahead and have cosmetic surgery. What are three tips that you would give to cosmetic surgery providers? You are the custodians of our health budget. It's an honour system. We're trusting you to bill correctly. So please do. Be very careful with your advertising and what you promise to patients. And the other thing I'd say for health providers is um, educate yourself to the maximum extent that you can about patient selection because patient selection is actually very important too in cosmetic surgery. What are three tips that you would give to cosmetic surgery patients? You have a right to be safe. If your surgeon at the first appointment tries to make you collude in an illegal claim to Medicare, run a mile, get yourself a new surgeon. And the third thing I would say to patients is you have to pay for this yourself. Taxpayers should not be reimbursing your cosmetic surgery. Thank you, Dr. Foe, for coming here today to speak on this podcast. Is there anything else you would like to say that you have not had the chance to say yet? No, I don't think so. I think we've covered everything and it's been an absolute pleasure being with the two of you here today. So thank you very much. It's important for cosmetic surgery patients to understand that cosmetic surgery is real surgery. They need to be armed with the facts around complaints and be prepared that something could go wrong. The risks are real. 
in order to navigate the complex nature of the cosmetic surgery complaint system and regulation in Australia, they need to ensure that they are doing proper research. It's also important for patients to not participate in Medicare fraud and for, pro and for providers to properly bill Medicare if they can. Dr. Margaret Foe is an expert in Medicare billing, and we are very, very grateful for her to share her expertise on this podcast. Make sure you follow us on TikTok and Instagram at operation.redress for snippets and shorts from today's episode.